everyone. It's so nice to see everyone. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that you're glad to see them today. Well, if we could go ahead and find our seats. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone here to Cross Point. Um, if you got a bulletin on your way in, there is a church connection sheet right here. You can tear that off and put it in the offering plate. Just a great way to communicate with us here at the church. Um, today's scripture reading, we are reading from Psalm 63, verses 2 through 4. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live in your name, I will lift up my hands. Uh, this is, of course, just another wonderful psalm. Um, little backstory on it. David wrote this psalm uh, when he was in hiding. Um, one of the commentaries I read, uh, he was longing for a friend he could trust and someone to help ease his loneliness. And um, God alone can be that comfort to us. So as we continue in a time of worship, um, just keep that on your mind. God is always there for us. No matter where we are, he will find us.
God, the indescribable God, um, and we just thank you so much that we can praise you in the good times and the bad, knowing that you are forever in control, Lord, and we just thank you so much for the peace that that brings us. God, I pray for this morning, and I thank you so much for being able to be here. I pray, Lord, that you um, lead and guide Pastor Jess through the sermon, and just thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Thank you. I don't know if you realize that came from the balcony. One of the opportunities that we've had over the last couple months is that those that are serving in kids zone, the adults down there, are actually bringing our children up into the balcony during a worship section and actually watching you as their role model. So be on your best behavior. Um, for them, and uh, but they are also being able to be a part of the service um, and kind of help with that transition at times when they start coming up into youth and middle school and going, what does it mean to be in the sanctuary? And so it's kind of really cool to see that transition and how much the students are actually embracing that. And so um, that's where that came from. I uh, also just want to say thank you to Ben for filling in Last week, uh, as Heather and I were able to get away, celebrating our anniversary, um, you know, even telling someone this morning, it's hard to believe that it's only been 19 years that we've been married, but on the flip side, it's how did 19 years fly by so fastly? Uh, and you got both ends of the spectrum, and, and that was Monday of last week that we got to celebrate that and get away up into Gardner, Montana, and just enjoyed that time together, and kids were at Grandpa and Grandma's house, and so... Um, I thank you and I thank Ben for taking those, that time to, to fill in, but we're back and I want us to look at God's word in the book of James again today. And it's, it's interesting to me, uh, the, the lyrics of the songs, they hit me. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I hope that you can take some of the lyrics, even indescribable, um, even in uh, the previous two songs, how much those lines carry into where we're going this morning. And so try and take some of those back and even going all the way back to Psalm 63 that Kyle read with us this morning about how um, uh, bless you as long as I live and in your name, I will lift your hands and how much that's going to be echoed in our text today as well. And so before I get in there, I want to remind us of our mission. Crosspoint's mission is helping people find and follow Jesus. That we want to do in everything that we do We want to lead people toward Christ so that they can follow Christ as well. And today we're going to be in James, James chapter 1, 9 through 18, entitled, God Endures. And really, as we look at the whole book of the book of James, we see that he brings real life face to face with real faith. What do the two actually look like together? Even though when you kind of look at the whole, that really... James focuses a lot on works, a lot of things that we do, right? But there's also a lot of faith, a lot of things that we need to trust God in and how those things actually work together. 
And so the idea of God endures comes from verse 17. And so I'm just going to plug that in there. And when we get there, you can kind of tie those pieces together. But I want to just kind of go back real quick in case you missed four weeks ago when we started this or three weeks ago as we started chapter one, because I know Ben spoke the past two weeks about the importance of the word of God in the believer's life and how important that is. And I, I, I can't disagree, right? It's so true. And James highlights that so much. And so a month ago, when we started the book of James, we looked at who is James? Who's writing this book? Right? It's the half-brother of Jesus. He was a doubter, along with a lot of his siblings, did not believe in Jesus alone, much less Jesus was the Messiah of the world. But yet, through his crucifixion, his family became believers. Not only that, he became a leader early on in Jerusalem, or early church. He later died as a martyr for his faith, uh, approximately 62 AD, when that took place, um, and that he was a slave for God. You can see his uh, Greek name there, too. But he is the one that's behind this text. He is the one pinning these things together. He is drawing from other writings. He is encouraging people. And yet as much as these teachings are disconnected, you can see how he themes or ties them together from one to the next. We also know that the recipients of the book of James, he refers to as the 12 tribes. These Jewish believers scattered abroad. They're outside of their normal home area where they settled, uh, whether it's from war, whether it's from being captured and kidnapped, I say kidnapped, but, you know, uh, side effects of war and being relocated. And even as a result, that extends to us as believers today, that these very teachings apply to us um, as general stories, general teachings that we can take with us. He wants us to be instructed and encouraged on how we live life, how life, when it brings stuff, right, stuff, it could be from the simple to the mundane, the, the very minor to the extremely complex that lasts years. He says that is life, and here's how we handle it through faith. In the structure of it, right, we kind of looked over just briefly on how James lays this whole book out. Chapter one is kind of like an introduction and a summary, right? He said, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to do. And then he goes in chapters two through five, these 12 teachings. And we're going to go through each one of those in the weeks to come. Uh, he draws some of those teachings from, you can see a parallelism to stories out of Matthew, Luke, and even uh, some nuggets out of Proverbs. He gives over 50 commands to the readers of that, that's including us. We'll see those commands as they're given. Uh, he emphasizes actions and development of faith, that they go and work together. Some of the themes that we see come and take care of themselves are care, caring for one another, looking out for one another, our speech, how we talk, how we encourage somebody, and how very easily we can also use those same words to tear somebody down. Wisdom how we use it for good, how we use it for, for evil. Same thing with wealth. Is it for good or is it for evil? And then, of course, he brings in prayer as well. And all of those themes come through in his teachings, in this first section of chapter 1. We've actually, matter of fact, we've actually hit on four of those themes already uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we're going to hit five of those today. Uh, I'm not kind of drawing out each one of them, but if you look at that, and Lord willing, next week, we'll hit the last three. So over three weeks of chapter one, we'll have touched on the 12 teachings, the 12 themes that we'll see in the rest of the book. So today, that brings us to God endures. What does that look like? And so our text in chapter one, verses nine through 18, I want you to follow along, read with me, read along with me, our whole text. And then we're going to kind of come back and bring this together. It says, believers who, have poor, who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. For those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass weathers. The little flowers droop and falls. And its beauty fades away in the same way the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. 
God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. And afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens, he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Oh, a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. And if I had to pick one verse out of all of that chunk to really kind of be a pivotal or a kind of key verse for this morning, I would say this comes out of verse 13. I'm going to reread it. It says, And remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. And I think it's pivotal because of the difference between test and temptation. Testing, right, versus tempting. And I think of it as, as I was kind of thinking through some of these things this week, I was kind of remember, reminded of, for me anyways, was high school Friday was test day. That every class was nothing but tests, most of them. The way our schedule worked, and we had Tuesdays and Thursdays were one schedule, Monday and Wednesdays was another schedule, and then Fridays we had all of our classes. And so quizzes and tests, that's what we went to. It made sense. Right? We needed to see where did we fall in the information that we had been learning throughout school. The teacher gave a test. The teacher wasn't tempting us. They were testing us. But when we sat down to take that test, what temptations did I have? Okay? I think you understand. Right? How close is the person next to me that I can kind of read their answers? Right? Or if the person in front of me is short enough, I might be able to look over their shoulders, okay? Um, Or when the teacher walks out of the room, how quietly can I whisper and receive answers in return? Now, did the teacher impose that temptation upon me? Okay? No. I was the one tempted because of what I wanted to perform out of the test that is now in front of me but did I prepare for it? Did I study for it? Right? I even had given up the idea to our youth that I would listen or read out and record my voice, the stuff that we had read, or maybe record the teacher, and then play it back while I slept. So through osmosis, I would retain. (laughs) It didn't work. It was more effort than it was, because I actually had to first read the information in order to record it. If I could bypass that, now that's a different story. But that was the difference between test and temptation, right? Knowing the information that we're going up into, but then how do I skirt around it or get what I want without doing all the work? And sometimes you would get away with it, sometimes you would get caught. But nonetheless, either way, it's wrong, it's a sin. Another story that came to mind is, is way back at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. We have two lovely people that God created in the beginning of the earth, right? It was Adam and Eve. He gave them one instruction. Do not eat the fruit of this one tree, right? That was the test. That was the instruction. That's what they had to follow. But what ensued? They were tempted, not by God. God made it very clear. Very one question, one answer. Very easy test. But they were tempted by the things of this world. Satan came on the scene, right? Their own human emotions came onto the scene. And all of a sudden, now they lost sight for that moment of who God is. And they gave in to the temptation that's now laying in front of them. Do I eat this fruit or don't I? Do I give in, knowing that it's wrong, or do I adhere to what God tells me to do? 
Isn't that really, by the end, the definition of what we need to do when we're faced with temptation when God gives us instruction? And so I thought this morning that we would actually read through a parallel story that I think really many of us can relate to that highlights a lot of what James is talking about, about whether or not we're poor or rich to talk about God. Whether the the sun rises or the grass withers, that this life is temporary and it will fade away. That God blesses those that wait and are tested and tempted, and they will receive the crown of life. That temptation comes from our own desires, not from God. Right? These are all the themes that James is talking about in the midst of this passage. And so I want us to read through the first chapter of Job, maybe a little bit more, and then the very last part of Job. And just I know it cuts out a ton of conversation in the middle, but his life, if I had to pick one person that was on James's mind when he wrote this, I could say Job fits this category. Now, I can't say that's true. I can't say that's the case. But to me, when we read through this story, I think what we just read in James will echo itself. So follow along. James chapter, or Job chapter 1. It says, There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil, and he had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 females Donkeys. Anybody relate to that number of animal? No, right? But we can, I mean, if we had to translate all of that into, say, a bank account of a million dollars, oh, I can, well, maybe we can't relate to that either, but (laughs) we have a little bit more of an idea of what kind of wealth a million dollars could be versus all of that livestock. But yet for Job, livestock equaled also, in order to raise that, land, right? Right? He was a wealthy, wealthy man. It goes on. It says, he also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's son would take turns preparing feasts in their own homes. Would I have any moms that say amen to that one? (laughs) And they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their own hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Can you you hear those first couple verses in James? That if you are poor, boast that God is honoring or lifting you up. If you are rich, boast in God that he has humbled yourself. Job is recognizing that even though he has wealth, that God is still with him. That his children are still part of his responsibility, and he's boasting about God's provision for forgiveness of sin on behalf of his children. Verse 6. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that is going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. And so Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. This is one of those weird conversations that we're okay, God, I'm going to have to trust this supernatural interaction that's going on here took place. Not sure how it happens on your level, but, you know, that kind of stuff here on earth is a little strange. But yet between God and Satan, there was this conversation about how much this individual, Job, was devoted to God. Again, boast, those that are rich boast about being humbled in God. And God showed, hey, I think Job's going to 
boast about me even in the midst of all of this. And Satan, or excuse me, God gives this test, if you will, to allow Satan to test Job. Not a temptation, a test. Verse 12, it says that. It says, all right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the the Lord's presence. And one day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. And when the Sabians raided us, or the Sabians, another outside group, they stole your animals, killed the farmhands, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news, that the fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all your shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Where did all his wealth go? It's gone. All of what he was brought for food, for income, for anything, it's gone. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. That three bands of the Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger arrived with this news, that your sons and daughters were feasting in their older brother's home. And suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all the sides. The house collapsed, and now all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job's response was that he stood up. He tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head, and he fell down to the ground to worship. I couldn't imagine in a matter of moments in a given day that your 401k has been stolen, your bank account has been robbed, your retirement has been squandered, and your family has been destroyed. Matter of moments, all of these people show up. And what was Job's response? I think the first part, I think, is pretty accurate for most of us, right? Tearing her clothes, maybe shaving her head, but... Some sort of grief, right? Some sort of physical outward of our inward emotional collapse. And yet, what did he fall down to the ground to do? He worshiped God, right? He echoes those first four verses of our 9, 10, 11, and 12, right? Giving God the worship that in richness, God, you humbled me. I will still boast about you. In poorness, I'm still going to boast about you because you will lift me up. I recognize that in a matter of moment, the green grass and the flowers that are there will fade away. And God, you will endure. Job's life, he recognizes this through his actions there at the end of chapter one. A few more verses in chapter two. He says, one day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. The accuser Satan came with them and the Lord asked, where did you come from? Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, um, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from the evil. And he has maintained his integrity, even though you urged me to harm him without cause. Again, God was not tempted. He did not actually harm Job. But that was Satan's response, right? Verse 4, Satan replied to the Lord, Skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. But reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you face to face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So uh, So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck down Job with the terrible boils from head to foot. And Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and nothing else, or never anything bad? And so in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. 
two tests that Job was given. Both times it attacked part of his life. Wealth, land, wealth, property, family, and now his own personal health. And in Job's response, each time it was coming back to God. He put God continually into his focus. Matter of fact, actually, if you looked at the next 40-ish chapters of Job, there is this ongoing dialogue between Job and one of his friends, Job and God, God back to Job, and even God to Job's friends. The struggle, we can see this processing of what does this mean? Why did this happen? How could we actually go through each one of these different things, trying to make things add up? And we see in these mental processes that there is times they're like, just give up. Just like his wife told him. Just give up. Curse God. Turn away. Die. Be done with it. Or maybe it's that you actually need to do like what Job did. To dig in. Go, you know what? This is going to be in here for the long haul. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to trust God no matter what. And sometimes we're tempted just to do our own thing, saying, you know what, God will forgive me anyway, so I might as well just do what I want, and I'll come back at some point in time and ask God for forgiveness. That's not the right response either. But yet we see that in conversation. In other words, we have this idea of a biblical response versus an unbiblical response. Is it how God wants us to respond, or is it how we want to respond? And I was reminded in high school that there was... You know, there's always many assemblies throughout school. Always many, whether it's for a pep assembly for like homecoming this past week, or maybe it's um, to, you know, announce a new teacher, or for whatever the reason was, I couldn't even tell you what the assembly was, but there's a handful of friends of mine that said, hey, let's ditch the assembly. We don't need to be here. Let's go. In my mind, it's, I justified, hey, you know what? They're technically optional at our school, even though everybody goes because it's kind of weird to be on a campus that is empty and vacant, especially when there's normally 2,000 people on it. So sure, why not? Let's go. So we leave campus. We go to over to his house. And then when we come back, guess who was at the opening of the gate? The teacher of the school, Right? We had a choice at that point in time to go, okay, do we tell the truth or don't we? Well, at that point in time, we actually were telling the truth. We did. We went to his house. However, as a result of our getting in trouble, we had what was called Saturday school. Okay, You actually had to sacrifice your Saturday morning from 8 to noon and show up and be in class much like a detention, except for not for our lunch period. It was for the whole morning. And I had this great idea to deceive my parents and not tell them. But it's like, wait a minute, how do I tell them that I have to go to school on Saturday when we, obviously school doesn't normally happen? So through over the course of the next period of moments that afternoon, I managed to arrange a few things with the school, come up with a story to tell mom and dad. I allowed the temptation of getting out of trouble to convolute what I really needed to do. Right? Here, Job faced that same thing. What do I actually do when I just lost my wealth? I lost my family. I'm losing my health. What do I do? Where do I go? And in James, we come back in verses 12 and 13, and we see Job's answer through it. It says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation, and afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Job comes, and he relies on that. Granted, this was written years, decades, centuries after Job's experience. But nonetheless, we see this played out in his response. He goes, God is Lord of my life. I am going to rely on him no matter what. And I am going to endure this testing. I'm going to endure the temptation. My friends are telling me to go the wrong direction. And as a result, we'll see here in a little bit that Job did receive his crown. He was rewarded for going through that testing, through that temptation. His friends steered him wrong. 
I mean, Job struggled. He had a mental breakdown. He had his own struggle going through those things. Don't get me wrong that he just kind of breezed through. Oh, yeah, it's there. No big deal. No, he struggled with them and had people there that were even misinforming him about who God was and what God was going to do and why God was doing that for him and to him. But yet he maintained accountability to God in the midst of it. And as a result, he was rewarded. He faced that testing from God and endured it. He resisted the temptations placed there by Satan. And I think that's the difference that we see. That the difference between the two things, right? Remember Adam and Eve, the test versus the temptation. The test in school, the test versus the temptation. Job recognized that there was a test that was there, or a circumstance to make the right or wrong decision, right? Versus where the temptation was coming from. And the temptation was not coming from God. It was coming from his circumstances around us. Matter of fact, we can see that in James 14 through 16. It says that temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And so don't be misled, my brothers and sisters, right? Job recognized that this is where those things are coming from. So he constantly had to go back to God, constantly had to get on his knees and pray to God for strength, to endurance, to make it through. I mean, if you wanted to look at it in this way, there's really kind of five D's, if you will. There's a desire, right? We're going through life and there all of a sudden a desire, a passion, or something comes up in our life, a desire. Now, out of the desire, is it right or wrong? No, it's just a desire. Which leads to the second D, is a decision. Let's say it's a movie that's put out in, the, in, the, in a theater, right? The desire is to go watch it or to go see what it is. Or have we, is it right or wrong yet? Don't know. We have to get through a decision. Through that decision, we have to weed through the third, deception. Right? What is in that movie? What, is, what will I succumb to? What will I watch? What will I be bombarded with? Is it something God would want me to or what I don't want? Right? We're evaluating the desire and the decision through the deception on what we need to do. Where does that temptation come from? What entices us? Right? What seeds are we going to plant that start to grow and that gives birth to death or that sin, that separation from God? The fourth D leads, obviously this is where the sin comes in, is the disobedience leading to death. The last two Ds, right? That our desire to do something, we have to make decisions about it and go through the deception or to deceive what is happening. And then we have to make that decision on which direction do I go? Do I obey God or do I disobey God? And if I disobey God, I am planting those seeds to allow sin to grow and give birth to death. And Job is weeding through that all of throughout those chapters on seeing James's words being played out. Matter of fact, we can look at it that sin equals a desire and an opportunity leading to an action. Right? That if we do something that God doesn't want us to do, that's the action because we had an opportunity that stemmed from a desire that we did not turn down. And Job, in the midst of all of his friends, in the midst of God interacting, he maintained his mind on Christ. Let's wrap it up in verse 40, or chapter 42, 7 through 17. Job goes through this. He says, After the Lord finished speaking to Job, he said to Elipaz, the, uh, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about him as my servant Job has. That hit, that hit me. And challenged me and said, wait a minute, am I being one who is accurate in displaying who or telling others on who God is? Am I being true to God's word to tell others about who he is? Obviously, Job's three friends, they weren't. They weren't grounded in what God would want him or where God was or who God is. He challenged me to say, am I true to God's word? So take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Seek seek forgiveness. 
So then my servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. And so Elipaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite, did as the Lord commanded them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Did you hear that? That Job still, despite their deception, forgave them, prayed on behalf, prayed to God on behalf of his friends. Right? Job weeded through it. He boasted again about God and who God was in the midst of all of it. Verse 10, it says, When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all of his brothers, sisters, and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money of a gold ring. And so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep. 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jemiah, Jemiah, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapik. Right? Job was rewarded for his faithfulness. Matter of fact, it goes on in verse 15. It says, In the land no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had a life, lived a long and full life. Now, we're not all going to be rewarded and live a long and full life the way that Job was. I mean, I couldn't imagine having 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, okay? That number baffles me, okay? But yet the wealth that he attributed or gained, not out of anything that he did other than trusting and boasting in the Lord, he found favor. His friends wavered, his friends were not focused, and his wife was not focused on God. But Job was. Matter of fact, I think we can come see that James and Job are pointing us right in the same place. Right at God. That God is the light. God is the center. God is the focus. God is everything that we need and who he is. And lo and behold, verse 17 says that. It says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. God endures. God lasts. He is throughout everything, doesn't change. We might not know God's ways, might not understand all of his reasons, but we do know that he is God and he will endure and he will last forever. Through all of it. Job did have that long in life, full life, right? He was even had a whole first half that was rich, but was destroyed and became twice as rich. Same number of kids and the kids that were known throughout the land and lived to be a ripe age. But we don't see that everywhere. But we do see, if we look at Enoch for a second, in Genesis chapter 5, It says that when Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. I'll let that sink in for those that are around 60 or older, having a child at that age. 65 years old, he had a child. But after the birth of Methuselah, he went on to live in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters, and he lived total 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. And then one day, he disappeared. He was gone. Why? Because of his righteousness. That close fellowship with God. Would we say that he lived a long and full life? Well, if you look at the number of 365 years, you were tempted to say yes. But if we look at all the people before in Genesis chapter 5 and after in Genesis chapter 5, they were living 7, 8, 900 years old. In other words, he lived one-third the length of life of those that were around him. 
Did he live a life that was long? No. But was it full? Yes. He had his focus on God. God doesn't change. He gives us the tools to go through the test to resist the temptations. And one day we will be called home. Whether it's going to be short or long, God has our, name, our, our days numbered. And it's good. Are we focused on God? Verse 18 says this, that God chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word and we out of all creation became his prized possession. Let me go backwards on that one. I don't know if you've realized that you are God's prized possession. That God put effort into you. That you are his trophy, his, well as it's written, possession. Because we can see it in Genesis chapter 1 again, 26 and 27. says, God said, let us make human image, human beings in our image to be like us. That's a reference to the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It says, They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. And so God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them, to reign over his creation. God used us. We are God's possession. We are the one that his prize, the one that he cherishes. So why wouldn't he reward us? And if that means our days are short because our life is full and we're following God, then we're called home. If we're here a long life like, like Job was and endured hardship because we're giving credit to God, then we have a long life to give to God. If we go back one step in the beginning of verse 18, it talks about that we are given his true word. In John 1, he puts it this way, that in the beginning, the word was already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He, was, he existed in the beginning with God. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. It's Jesus Christ. He came. He was the word that James refers to and brings us right here his own message. But he chose us to spread that message, to spread that word to the people around us, that in the midst of highs and lows of life, are we boasting and bragging about God? That, excuse me, when difficult times or a test, a decision that has to be made, are we tempted to go our own way and choose not God, or are we going to stick with, I'm going to trust God? That when we are chosen to spread this message around the world, it could be around the world as we know it. As we from, from continent to continent, across the oceans, across the borders. Or it might be our next door neighbor. Or the person that we literally bump into in the grocery store. It's our responsibility as Christians who God has placed us here on earth. That people have placed their faith in God. That it's our responsibility to trust God follow God, to know God, so that when real life happens, we can stand the way that Job stood. That we can still take the test of life and continue to follow God. When we were away up in Gardner, I don't even think I told uh, my wife that this happened. Sunday morning, we stopped at um, a place called Yellowstone Perk. Great food, very pricey, but great food. I think anywhere there, it's a little pricey. But we got up that morning, and I threw on my shirt. It was a black shirt. It said Jesus right down the center of it. Didn't think much of it. I walk into the store, order the food. She runs out to go get something else. And while I'm there, another guy ordered and turns around, and he sees my shirt. And this is not an attest uh, to, for me. This is for him. That he saw that shirt, and without hesitation, he goes, do you love Jesus? Uh, 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 uh. What am I going to say, right? I said, yes, I do. Absolutely. But in the midst of that store, in the midst of what it is, I was empowered by him that he was willing to be bold enough to come out and share and witness. And he told me that he was from Florida and they were up visiting and, and told me a little bit about their youth group and what they were doing there and some of the outreach that they were doing and telling people about Jesus. The love he had because of a, a shirt that I was wearing that gave him the courage to speak out and say, 
Do you love Jesus? And so I ask you this morning, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus the way that Job did? That in order to see our life, in order for us to be God's prized possession, we have to give our life to God. We have to follow him. And so maybe you're sitting there today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, never trust him. It's simple. Simply say, God, I trust you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of those temptations that I've chosen to go the wrong way. I want to follow you. Take control of my life. If you've said that before, something along that, you are a child of God. And as we go through James, that's what James is about, is that child of God. But as we come and we stand here in just a second, if you made that decision today, I want to celebrate with you. I'd love to pray with you right here in front. Or maybe you have other things that are on your mind that are keeping you from keeping your focus on God. That you have those friends that are around you that you just need to come and pray. Get uncomfortable a little bit out of your seat and come and pray directly to God and give those back to him. Or maybe you're realizing that I need a church family to come alongside me. You want to be a member of Crosspoint. Or more importantly, maybe you have never been baptized and you never have told people publicly that I belong to Christ and I want them to do so because God has asked me to be baptized and I want you to be a part of it. If that's a decision that you need to make during this song, will you come and do that? Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are and what we do. God, may what we do please you because of your word. Because of the instructions that we have received from you, that we can follow them, that we can put that first, that we can put down the temptations, to put aside the hardships and the stuff that seeks us first. But may we seek you first. That when we face a test or a decision to do what is right or what is wrong, maybe God, may we do what is right. May we please you. God, as we enter this time of this song, this closing song, that you can encourage people to pray to you, to give temptation over to you, to pray the desire for baptism. I pray for a desire to come and and acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior in their life. Lord, I ask that as we go from this place later later on, that we can see people in our community And we can see people abroad that they are ones that you desire, that you cherish a relationship with, that we can be bold. I pray this all in your son's name. Amen. If you have a decision to make, please make it. Would you stand and sing?
may be seated. If we could have the ushers go ahead and come up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this sermon and the small group discussion we had. And it's amazing how you intertwine it all together to apply to our lives. We ask that you accept these offerings that we give with glad hearts for the furtherment of your kingdom. We ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. We started our new women's Bible study at 9 a.m. last Thursday. The study is on Jen Wilkins' book, In His Image, which explores 10 ways God calls us to reflect his character. We'll meet every Thursday uh, until the study ends on November 30th. Check your bulletin for more details, and there's a sign-up sheet at the back table. We are still in need of one more team to help prepare our Wednesday night dinners, so if you'd like to be a part of the teams that help prepare once a month, um, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table for that as well. We begin our new evening women's Bible study last Sunday. We had a great guest speaker and a wonderful time getting together. We will meet at the Bighorn campus on Sunday evenings, and we would love to see you all. We'll begin an in-depth study of the book of James on October 8th that you won't want to miss. So please bring a snack to share if you like. And you can call Gail Carver or Jen McMillan if you have any questions. Do you like decorating? Our decorating church committee is looking for some fresh faces to help us decorate the sanctuary for the upcoming holidays, especially Christmas. So if you're interested in joining our committee or have questions, you can call Christy St. Clair or myself. Finally, Operation Christmas Child is approaching and we're still collecting items to prepare for our November packing party. For the month of September, we are collecting toys and those big wow items that we put in boxes. So if you have any items for the month of September or from the past, past months, please bring them to the church office. We will also be collecting t-shirts of any size or color that you would like to donate so that we can make them into jump ropes for Operation Christmas Child. So if you have some, you can place those in the clear bin at the back table. So that's it. This has been Laura Barthelmus with your Crosspoint 2-Minute Check-In. So yeah, let me...